So let's take an example, right? And the rest of what I'm going to do is to sort of take this particular example, which is a dot product, right? A three element dot product. Essentially what we have is some X of N coming in here, right? And we have some delay structure, X of N minus one, X of N minus two being generated by putting it through some kind of uh, delay uh, registers. And the output is going to be the dot product of these x of n, x of n minus 1, x of n minus 2, that vector with the vector w1, w2, w3. Okay. And, you know, the sort of trivial thing that you can think about over here would simply be a structure that looks like this. I would have w1 over here, w2 over here, and w3 over here, and Right. This part over here, I'm just going to call the adder module. Right? How it is implemented internally, I don't really care. Right? And what I have shown over here is one possible implementation where essentially what we are saying is the W1, W2, W3 values are each sitting on some specific uh, compute module. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, so there is a slight bit of confusion over here. Uh, pardon the, uh, you know, sort of confusing terminology because I think I missed out one part from Kang's paper, which is that he's actually considering it as W1X1 plus W2X2 plus W3X3. And the next output would be W1X2, W2X3, W3X4 and so on. Okay. So uh, that part of it, I mean, what I have written over here is actually more a filter than a dot product. And uh, therefore the indices might be reversed. Right? But it doesn't make any difference to the final implementation. What we are ultimately saying out here is each block, so this is a processing element, it contains a weight, it takes an input x in and gives out an output z out, which is basically w into x in. Okay, So this is what is being done. And at the same time, it also takes the x in and copies it to x out. Okay, So z out is the actual computation w into xn but x out right is now explicitly treated as one of the outputs of this module okay that is what allows us to basically make this processing element chain we can now say that this chain uh, this processing element has two outputs one is the actual computation the z out but it also has the x out which is basically the data that it got once again it just forwards it that is treated as an explicit step over here okay and in some ways, effectively, what we are saying is this diagram on the left and the diagram that I've drawn on the right are the same. Okay. And those multipliers are uh, multiplication by, you know, the constant W1, W2, W3 are basically the individual processing elements. Okay. So you can see that the processing elements in our design could be very simple, right? I mean, it could be as simple as just a single multiplier or maybe an adder even, right? On the other hand, the way that the processing, uh, you know, the, the analysis of systolic areas happens, this is not absolutely necessary, right? To, to some extent it is because what systolic areas do is they also depend a lot on this analysis of what happens in each clock cycle, right? But just like in the past, we talked about folding and, uh, you know, uh, different ways by which I could have my sample rate and my clock rate being different from each other. Here also, I could potentially think about each processing element doing multiple computations and having one sort of, you know, token interval, a sample interval within which it does one computation and passes the data on to its neighbors. Okay. That would still fall under the idea of a systolic array. So, uh, and, you know, the analysis would be the same way that you can do it. Okay, so this is the example that we are going to work with, right? And what we want is to try and come up with some kind of systematic techniques that will allow us to analyze the problem to be implemented, in this case, a dot product, right? And basically say, okay, how can I go about systematically implementing this, right? What are the different spatial uh, connections that are required for this computation? And uh, how do I then finally map this into a sort of space time combination? All we are talking about over here is time in the sense that at what time instant do we, does each operation occur? And what I mean by space is which processor number, right? If I have multiple processors, then which processor number or where in the processor design space 
is a particular operation going to happen? If you think about it, this is exactly a scheduling problem. Okay, that's exactly the problem that scheduling is also trying to solve. And it's just that for the kinds of problems that we are considering over here, there are very systematic sort of uh, mapping techniques that can be used in order to convert one to the other. What I'm going to do over here today is to look at one particular way in which we can formulate the problem and you know show how that can be used in order to derive multiple different hardware implementations corresponding to a given input problem. Okay, Like I said, there is a huge amount of literature that covers the background of systolic arrays, right? which means that what I'm doing is barely scratching the surface. And there are you know, many different techniques. There were even at some point compilers that were built basically for generating systolic array architectures for problems. One of the reasons why they are not sort of commonly seen and used often is that they are highly specialized, right? The systolic array kind of approach can be used only in the specific context of certain kinds of signal processing algorithms that have this regularity. Okay. All right. So in order to you know, do the analysis, we are going to start with this concept of a regular dependence graph. Let's try and understand what we mean by a regular dependence graph. What is the connection of this graph with the computations that we are performing and how do we use it in order to do this mapping problem that we are talking about? So now this uh, regular dependence graph, the structure that I have shown over here, right, essentially is just some kind of a two-dimensional grid. And for the present case, it is two-dimensional, right? Now, what are the what is this i-axis? What is this j-axis? Let's sort of look at it and try and understand what are the different things that are happening there, right? The assumption I'm going to make is that each of these things, the computation that I'm trying to perform. I think, again, the slight change in terminology, I'm going to use W0 into X of N, W1 X of N minus 1, W2 X of N minus 2. So with this in mind, what I'm going to do is say that this is an IJ axis, right? And this point essentially corresponds to a point 0, 0, that is I is equal to 0, J is equal to 0, right? Similarly, this would be 1, 0, 2, 0, this would be 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 2, 4, 2, and so on. Okay. So these are essentially nothing but grid points in a two dimensional xy axis where instead of xy, I call them the ij axis. Okay. So what are the ij axis? Let's look at that, try and understand that a little bit better. I'm going to say that essentially every sort of vertical line on the for different points on the x-axis corresponds to a different value of x so you know the first line corresponds to x0 then x1 x2 x3 and so on okay and similarly the lines that we have over here the horizontal lines correspond to w0 w1 w2 okay now i've just drawn these as lines keep in mind that what i'm drawing right now has no concept of time so even though there is an arrow it is not you shouldn't think of it as x0 is moving along the vertical line or W0 is moving along the horizontal line. In fact, the arrows are more or less irrelevant here, right? You should just probably ignore them for the time being. What is important is understanding what happens at these intersections, right? So over here, effectively what we are saying is W2 into X0 is the computation that is actually going to happen, right? Similarly, over here, what is going to happen is W1 into X2. So these computations happen at these intersection points, which means that if I now look closely at it, let me just get rid of this and instead write down what, what happens over here. This is going to be W1, X1, and this is going to be W0, X2. Okay. Why did I mark these three? Because if you look at it, you will notice that if I now add these values together, right? Again, I'm putting arrows, the arrows, why did I choose this particular direction for the arrows and not the opposite direction? You could have chosen the opposite direction as well. It would just change the interpretation of some of the numbers in the graph. I am choosing this down and right direction. Okay. And what does this give you? This will basically give you the value W2 into X0 plus W1 into X1 plus W0 into X2 
which is basically going to be equal to y2. Okay. And what that further means is that, you know, if I now look at something like this, this point would be w2 into x1, w1 into x2, w0 into x3, right? And if I now combine these together, what I'll have over here is w2 x1, w1 x2, w0 x3 is equal to y3. Right? So, in other words, each of these things is giving out one value of y. Okay, And essentially what I have done by drawing this kind of a structure is to say that this is one way by which I can capture the dependencies. Why are these dependencies? Because ultimately the most important thing to keep in mind over here is that y2, for example, depends on these three values. Right? So, y2 basically depends on those three computations happening. And similarly, y3 depends on these computations happening. What we have done, even though the direction of the arrows may not really be relevant and you might ask the question, why did I put them down and right you know, in this particular direction? Like I said, it does not really matter too much. You could have chosen the other direction. Your analysis will change correspondingly right, of the rest of the system. But for the time being, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. This is okay. I can go ahead and construct it like this. This structure that I have drawn over here is something called a regular dependence graph. Regular because you know it has this nice periodic repeating pattern and dependence graph because its sole purpose is to capture the dependencies between the different computations. Okay, What do I do with this regular dependence graph? I mean this is just actually redrawing the same structure. Right. What, what am I going to do with this regular dependence graph? I now plan to basically map this okay, onto some kind of hardware structure. Okay. And one way by which you could sort of think about what is happening over here is, just to sort of as a motivating example, I'm going to tell you, think about what will happen if I just look along this direction. right? project along this direction. What do I mean by that? One way of looking at it would simply be to say that, you know, this is a wall, right? And therefore, what will end up happening is there will be one processing element with W2 sitting over here. There would be something with W1 sitting over here. And there would be something with W0 sitting over here, right? And what I'm going to do is the rest of it. In other words, what I've done is I've taken this two-dimensional structure and mapped it onto a 1D processor space. These are the processing elements, right? The rest of it I'm going to say, right? So these edges, this essentially corresponds to movement in time. Okay. And similarly, the downward edges also correspond possibly. I mean, if there is any movement which is happening downwards, it essentially corresponds to movement in time. Okay. Anything which is happening along the x-axis gets mapped onto the same processor. Okay. So even if there is some movement along the x-axis, it basically says come back to the same processor. If there is a move, that's why basically all the W2, for example, right, is sort of moving along the x-axis. But because I have chosen to project along that direction that I've shown over here on the left side, it means that there is no real movement of the weights. They remain on the same processor again and again. Okay. Whereas the X values need to move from one processing element to another. How does that movement happen? It needs to happen in time. Okay. And this is what is, you know, ultimately what we are doing in terms of the mapping of this algorithm. Okay, or this problem onto the hardware architecture. The way that we do it is we define something called a projection vector. Okay, And this projection vector or iteration vector essentially says that two nodes in the RDG, the regular dependence graph, that are displaced by D or multiples of D will execute on the same processor. Okay, Let's go back and understand this in the context of this diagram that we have over here. right? Let me call this node A and this one is node B. Okay. And there's another one, node C out here. 
okay so effectively over here a what is the index value of that it is 0 comma 0 right b is 1 comma 0 and c is 1 comma 1 okay what is this b in this case I'm putting the bar on top to indicate it's a vector notation, right? It basically indicates a vector 1, 0. So by the way, I mean, I'm drawing this in columns, right? And this is a general sort of convention that is followed. So I should actually be calling these points as A transpose, B transpose, and C transpose, right? Because our default is to use so-called column vectors. Right? So, effectively what we are saying in other words is now, what is the difference B minus A? Right? B minus A is the vector one zero, right? In other words, it basically differs by one on the I axis, zero on the uh, J axis, right? The j axis is basically the vertical axis so a and b have the same value of j and they differ by 1 in i okay this is equal to d so a and b execute on same processor but c minus b is equal to 0 1 if this is not equal to d and which means that they basically execute on different processors Okay. So, in other words, what we are saying is, you know, I, had, I now have this de dependence graph and what I am doing is by choosing this projection vector, I am going to map all of these computations onto some one dimensional uh, strip of processors over here, right? And basically those processors, that line of processors can now communicate with each other. But the important thing is I now know which processor each computational unit over here maps onto. Okay. Now, of course, as long as I project along this horizontal x direction, everything is okay. But if I choose some other projection direction, then it looks as though, you know, the number of processors can essentially become infinite because even though W0, W1, W2, there are only three weights in the system, the number of inputs x0, x1, x2 is un, you know, unlimited, right? There is a way of getting around that. We basically say that, you know, I mean, I will sort of do a modulo after some time and come back to the same processor. Uh, in this way, we'll, we'll get to that later when we look at an exam. All right, so we understand what a projection vector is. Along with that, right, I can also define something called a processor space vector, right, where effectively what I'm saying is, you know, I'm saying that this P transpose I, this processor space vector will be some vector of the form P1, P2. And if I have a node with index i j then p transpose i will give me the processor number or the processor index on which that particular node is going to execute okay in other words all that it's doing is it's doing exactly the same thing as d but it's maybe a slightly easier way of computing the processor the actual node index onto which uh, the processor index onto which a node is going to get mapped Okay, it is actually slightly more complicated than that. The reason being that for a given projection vector, I could actually have multiple different processor space vectors, right? All that is required, if you think about it, is effectively, you know, if you go back to this diagram, what I'm saying is, I want some value P1, P2, which when I multiply by IJ, will give me the index of the processor onto which something gets mapped. Go look at this effectively what i'm saying over here is i want to find out the j index of the of a node right why because a j index of the node directly tells me which of these processors on the right it is going to get mapped on right the d vector has basically told me that a and b and everything along that line gets mapped onto processor w0 or process, processor number zero why is zero because that is the j index of that particular line Similarly, C gets mapped onto processor 1. The J index of C is 1. 
the next some other node would get mapped onto processor 2 because its j index is equal to 2 right which means that looking at it this way effectively what it says is this p1 p2 is just a set of values which picks out the j index of the uh, node that we are considering okay and we have one more term that we need to introduce it's called the sh scheduling vector so what is the scheduling vector this is once again just one more vector which we bring in the interpretation of this vector says if i have an index a node with index i j right with the uh, position i j the time at which it will be executed is given by this expression s transpose i right so this is basically equal to s1 i plus s2 j in this case right so these are the three terms that we need to bring in in order to understand how to implement this right so let's in order to understand what kind of uh, meaning they bring to the system let's look at some examples okay before we do that let's look at a couple of implications of this this processor space vector and the projection vector must be orthogonal right now why is that because effectively what i'm saying is consider some node x right which has coordinates ix jx okay and some other node y which is i y j y and let's say they are separated by d okay so in other words y minus x is equal to d or it could be any other multiple of d as well we don't care but to keep things simple let's just consider that it's equal to d okay now which processor is x mapped to that's going to be given by p transpose x and similarly if i consider the question for y that's going to be given by p transpose y right and we know that because y minus x is equal to d both must be on the same processor right that was after all our definition of our projection vector right which means that p transpose x is equal to p transpose y which basically means that p transpose into y minus x is equal to 0 or p transpose d must be equal to 0 okay so this is a requirement i mean you don't need to sort of put it over there it has to automatically come about from the definition of the processor space vector and the projection vector right and similarly we also define something called the hardware utilization efficiency let's again consider the same thing right i have x over here and i have y over here okay and they are mapped onto some processor p right so then what happens i know that x and y are onto the same processor and because they differ by d it means that they are sort of adjacent computations on the same processor right x is the first computation y is the next computation happening on the processor so now if i look at this s transpose y is time of scheduling y and s transpose x is the time of scheduling x okay once again what is the difference between them s transpose y minus x is equal to s transpose d equals time between x and y okay so in other words if this is equal to 1 means that every cycle a new operation happens on the processor right but if it's equal to 2 for example it means that only every alternate clock cycle a new pro a new operation is going to happen on that processor right if i want to compute the hardware utilization efficiency what am i interested in is the processor doing something useful on every clock cycle in other words i want s transpose d to be equal to 1 if i find that s transpose d is equal to 2 
effectively what it's telling me is that the processor basically gets a new computation only once every alternate clock cycle if it's three it's once in every three clock cycles and so on okay so that s transpose b can directly be used in order to compute the hardware utilization efficiency of whatever design that you come up with now probably you are thinking you know always you want to have hardware utilization efficiency equal to one in that case generally speaking that is true but there can be certain situations where it makes sense to you know work with a lower hardware utilization efficiency because it makes your communication and other sort of problems associated with the design easier to handle okay now the last step that we need to think about before we actually go to mapping that dependence graph that we had into multiple different examples over here if there is an edge in the dependence graph right the map hardware will have an edge from where which corresponds to the value p transpose e right so e over here is a vector and p transpose e over here will also this finally will also be a vector right but basically what it says is it will have a space and time component right in other words it will say whether i should remain on the same processor or jump to another processor and whether it should happen at the same time instant or with uh, you know um, the s transpose e number of delays okay so this p transpose e and s transpose e will allow you to find out whether the data should move and where it should move and when it should move okay so the mapping problem is basically going to be we assume that we somehow have the rdg the regular dependence graph right which is a spatial representation of all the computations that we need to do and what we do is then map this onto the processor space using a projection vector right which is that d and the p transpose which is related to d is in fact used in order to compute the uh, location so for example what we have is supposing for a two dimensional case i have this ij as my computational node index it gets mapped onto processor number j j prime and this is the time instant at which it gets mapped 